Um, my presentation, well, it's right to the front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you better have more time than that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, um, my, my presentation will uh, try to make some reflections on how, in the context of um, the, the key theme of this conference, which is ideas that work for industrial development, what, what does that mean uh, in terms of trade-offs uh, between development and resources? And in this instance, I will be focusing primarily on natural resources. And I think it's actually quite uh, an opportune time to make a case on ensuring that there is such considerations, taking into account that um, CSIR, for example, is in the process of developing an industrial strategy to say, um, what are some <clears throat> of the considerations that need to be built into the development of such a strategy? And how can the understanding of trade-offs between natural resources and industrial development inform future technology options uh, or research areas that uh, the organization should be focusing on. <coughs> so my first slide just uh, tried to provide a global picture in terms of what is the relationship between the natural uh, resource base with uh, your productive process, um, which typifies uh, your industrial development considerations, particularly in the development of, uh, of such strategies. And also there's a recognition of the feedbacks that one gets from uh, the, the, the industrial process or the productive processes back into the natural resource base. So the, the case that uh, I would like to make today is that when considering uh, any industrial development strategy or any industrial development efforts, uh, the innovation the research and development does not only lie in that space. I think the presentation that, that we just had from Professor Majosi and the, the previous presentation on industrial symbiosis, for example, focused on how do we address innovation in that space. However, being a natural resource scientist, um, there's a lot of innovation that we need to see in that space in terms of understanding the resource demands or natural resource demands that are placed by the decisions or the options that we choose uh, in that area. As well as what sort of um, research and development options do we have in respect of how we protect the natural resource base and ensure um, that the productive processes do maintain um, uh, sufficient quantities of the inputs that we have to productive processes. So uh, that's the case that I, I wish to make. And what is quite obvious is that uh, your industrial development is an excess question. The last presentation, for example, was demonstrating how that operates in a chemical plant. Um, however, even if you step back at a much closer resolution in terms of industrial options that we identify through our industrial policy action plan, that has an impact on how we manage other resources such as energy, your biomass, uh, implications on air as well as, uh, as water. So what, uh, what I'm making a case for here is that um, the natural resources that we have present a, a production possibilities frontier, for lack of a better word, that any economy, um, in this case I will be talking about the South African economy, that needs to be considered. Typical example, um, Professor Majosi, you actually covered it. some of the things that I would like to talk about to say, if you demand more energy, effectively you are saying you need more water. And from an economy-wide perspective, these are the types of trade-offs that are embedded in industrial options that, that we present that needs to be considered from a natural resource uh, point of view. So if one is looking at industrial development, it's important that you address both the feedstocks as well as the production, productive processes that are involved in those sectors that uh, you are looking at. And uh, I presented a question at the bottom, you know, of are there limits to growth? Because 
this has been a pervasive question when it comes to economies. There's, there's, there's various paradigms. Um, if, for example, you look at your neo Malthusian types of theories, okay, which link your population growth uh, to food production, they suggest that um, food, food, pro food production will constrain your population growth. But on the other extreme, if you look at your neoclassical economists, you know, it's like there's this never-ending relationship of growth between resources and production, of which, um, in my view, uh, the truth probably lies in between, because um, technology, for example, um, over the last hundred years have proved that the, the Malthusian uh, type of framing, which says natural resources will constrain growth, it's, it's got its limitations. Technological innovations have created space for increased resource use efficiencies as well as um, alternative uh, feedstocks for producing the same types of, of products. But on one hand, it's not plausible that um, there's no limit to growth uh, based on the constraint of resources. Uh, what appeals to me is an understanding that there are limits to growth, but those are not absolute limits. It's the 2010 limit of what resources um, can be able to, to support in terms of industrial development will be different from 2020, primarily because of the technological change that informs resource use efficiencies as well as the identification of alternative uh, resources. Now, if we come back to our beloved country, um, South Africa, um, and one is seeking to understand these trade-offs between natural resources as well as, um, as development. The first step that is important is basically to understand what are the country priorities. I mean, if you are looking at South Africa, uh, the three unemployment, inequality, as well as poverty uh, are some of the biggest challenges that, that face us um, as a nation. And unfortunately, if you look at the recent history, we are going in the wrong direction when it comes to employment. And if you look at the Gini of coefficient, uh, for example, the changes, even though we are having, uh, we are moving in a positive direction, the rate at which the change is taking place is not sufficient to meet some of the objectives that we have in our national development planning processes. And if you look at poverty, which is, I mean, this should be the lower bound poverty level. Even there, we've got a significant proportion of our population that has to forego food in order to, um, to uh, acquire some commodities that they need within their lives. So this is um, the scenario that we have as a country and we believe, uh, because we've got a national development plan, we believe that um, if we get 6% growth going to 2030, we will be able to make significant impact or significant changes in the state of, of those three aspects. But if you look at the recent economic growth, um, again, we have not been um, uh, close, uh, to say the least, uh, to that level of growth. But we've got the Industrial Policy Action Plan, for example, which identifies certain sectors that are meant to drive uh, economic growth in the country uh, to those levels such that we can be able to address our our national priorities. So in, in all of these, they've got a different relationship that they have with natural resources. Um, whether you're talking water, you're talking biomass, any feedstock, natural resource feedstock that um, we have to undertake. But if you were to ask me, we've got no idea of if we were to achieve the growth in the automotive sector, growth in metal fabrication, agro-processing, etc. We've got no clue of what does that mean for water resources in South Africa. Okay. Do we have the water, for example, to get us there? Do we have the type of energy uh, that will help us to get there? Um, do we, in terms of resources which may not be natural in, in this instance, in terms of iron ore, we export a lot. If that changes, um, we have managed to achieve um, the desired growth in the automotive sector. How much consum consumption of some of the minerals that we have um, within the country would have to be shifted to other sectors or other geographies within, uh, within the country. 
And if, if that should be the case, um, what are the implications on a, a whole lot of other things? So this, in my, uh, in my view, is that um, this is the center of what um, our consideration of the fourth of industrialization of this country, as well as our engagement in the fourth industrial revolution, should actually be looking at to say, what is the relationship between uh, these sectors, as well as the natural resource endowments that we have, um, in order to, to be able to, uh, to at least plausibly say, um, we do have a fair chance of achieving um, these national development objectives that we have. So this type of picture presents one with, uh, with a few questions. The, the first one being, can the required growth in all this, the industrial sectors that we're looking at um, be achieved in terms of available resources? And we're not naive, and I am not naive to think that all of all resources that are needed for this production has have to come from South Africa. You can get them from anywhere else uh, in some instances. For example, in growing your automotive sector, you can import steel rather than using steel from from Sisha, for example, in the Northern Cape. But if you do that, that also have certain implications on social and economic indicators that uh, you are trying to address uh, in that aspect. And the second question is, what options do we have to increase resource availability? I think the presentations that we had um, earlier precisely focus on those aspects of um, how do you increase resource availability because avoided water use or avoided energy use is increasing availability of the resource in order to support this suite of sectors. And a very important question, especially coming from a natural resource perspective, is what are the production possibilities in light of climate change? Because surface water resources that we have as a country are not necessarily what they will be in, uh, in the near future. Um, the energy options that we have as a country may be constrained going forward. So what I've done in this presentation, in my next slide, is to look at the water situation in South Africa as well as energy. But the understanding should be that these are not the only two important resources that need to be considered in how do we manage trade-offs between development, industrialization, as well as uh, natural resources. But for simplicity, I've just used two. The first one being water. This is the picture that we have as a country. I mean, this is courtesy of Green Cape 2016. Uh, this, uh, this is their infographic. Uh, one of the key things to note uh, in this, if I start from the bottom, is that uh, we've got uh, about 15 billion cubic meters of water um, as a country that have been allocated. However, according to the analysis of Green Cape, uh, by 2030, our demand we will be 17.7 billion uh, cubic meters of water. And in, even there, there are certain tricks that water people will always put into those numbers. The question of assurance of supply. Um, we can continue having, uh, I mean at this stage, this is the allocation that we have, but one thing that is plausible is that in light of climate change, even if there's no growth in demand, the assurance of supply of that allocation will, will change. And a clear illustration will be that um, there's a lot of people in the Western Cape right now who have paper water. They, they've got an allocation of water that um, they are entitled to, but in reality that water is not there. So this is the type of scenario that we are likely to be facing as uh, a country going forward. And besides uh, that assurance of supply, even this part of the equation is likely to change because the evapotranspirative demand or the evaporation demand in light of climate change as an example is expected to be increased. Precipitation in some parts of the country is expected to go down. So all these figures uh, are likely to change. Now the question becomes, how do we understand this water scenario in the context of industrial development or the dreams that we have as a country to drive uh, economic development. Some of the interesting things I know um, within CSIR, the water group does a little bit of this work. 
but some of the information that we need to understand um, in order to be able to effectively address trade-offs is what is the consumption per unit, for example, of the water resource. If you look at, I mean, these are figures from gold fields uh, for 2014-2015 uh, financial year. I mean, in mining, uh, gold mining, and that specific organization, this is what we are looking at, 119 million cubic meters of water to produce a single ounce of, uh, of gold. And uh, when it comes to textile, to produce a t-shirt, for example, it takes about 2.7 cubic meters to, uh, to produce a simple cotton t-shirt. Right? Now, if we look at the industrial options that we identified in IPEG, if I can come back here, <coughs> will we, do we have a sense of what the growth that we are looking for will mean, understanding this consumption factor? in terms of available water within the country. That determines the types of production possibilities that uh, we have as a country. However, it's not only about uh, natural resources being a constraint, but it's also um, a point of identifying uh, what are the important research and development areas in order to increase availability. Something that you may not see over there is that about 37% of our water is lost through um, leakage, poor infrastructure in urban areas. So if we've got an organization like the CSIR um, that is focusing on enhancing industrial opportunities for the country, I think I'll put my money on saying let's invest on technologies that help us manage water leaks in, in, in the country and in doing so it also presents trade opportunities for us because this problem is not unique. Um, to the country. If we take the example of energy, for example, um, okay, this is our source of energy and this is the an average generation that we have had uh, from ESCOM in the last uh, seven years. And the use of those, if one takes just the industrial sectors, all right, you can be able to get a sense of um, what is uh, the relationship between uh, each of those sectors with energy demand. Um, and in that instance, again, we've got an IPEP that has certain dreams for each of these. I mean, yesterday, I attended a session on mining. There's a whole lot of enhancements in the mining value chain that we envisage as a country. And I was also in the shale gas uh, session. There's certain dreams that we have with regards to the development of this resource. All right? But um, what we need to understand is firstly, because energy itself, energy generation itself is, an, for example, is a water consuming option. And secondly, the options that we have as a country of the energy type that we can use is going to be constrained in the near future. We are in a world that is moving towards uh, a, a much more stringent carbon constraint. So the scenario that we have um, in this picture is going to change in the country um, over time. This is definitely going to increase and that component is going to, to decrease. But again, what do we need to understand in terms of trade-offs as a country is um, what is the relationship between the industrial options that we put forward um, with energy demand that we, we have as a country and how will, what are the possibilities of uh, our energy mix going forward. And in here again, this is um, probably less qualified to, to talk about this, maybe Professor Majosi will talk about it. But these are some, or in, in, in your industrial sectors, manufacturing sectors, these are some of your energy drivers. So this tells me that if one wants to address electricity demand or increasing availability of energy for our industrial development, we need to be looking at some of these. And the presentation that the presentations that we had today, for example, looked at that quite uh, significantly. So it, it's a no-brainer in my view that we should be focusing our industrial development options uh, in that area. Now, there is a need uh, to understand what sort of questions that does the nexus 
or trade-offs between development and, uh, and, and natural resources present to us. If we use the logic that I presented in the previous slides, it's important that we understand um, what is the energy factor for the different sectors that we have, and also what is the water use factor for the different sectors that we have, such that we can have a good understanding of what the economy-wide demand is, and how we can ensure that we've got a meaningful um, um, industrial strategy or in the, uh, industrial strategy research um, as, as the CSIR will be to understand what is the industrial, what, what scenarios do we have in terms of the industrial mix. I mean, we can have one to any number that you want to put on the table, but what is important is to understand that uh, your production possibilities will be limited by the various quantities that are there. And if not, it also helps in making policy decisions on where investments will be and what sort of technological options are available to us. And in this instance, when I talk of technology, I mean, I'll use water as an example. It's not uh, your hard technologies. There's also soft technologies that the country needs to be aware of. An example is the concept of virtual water. Okay? If, for example, um, that particular sector um, has got a, a, high, a, a luxurious relationship with water, you may decide on how do you um, make use of, I mean, just north of us, you go to the Zambias, the DRCs, the Tanzanias, etc. They've got much more abundant water than we have, and there are certain products that you can um, actually source from those countries such that you can be able to get the best back for your cubic meter of water that you have. So these are some of the considerations that an understanding of these trade-offs uh, and the nexus relationship between natural resources and industrial development will help policy making as well as investment decisions by uh, companies for that matter. But some of the questions um, that need to be looked at is what is the carbon constraint and decarbonization rate? Okay. Because uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, what I think about is climate negotiations. It's like how do we ensure that global average temperature increases um, do not get to dangerous levels? And over time, we understand that um, there will be a carbon constraint for all countries, and that has an impact on the options that you have on energy. And also, another question is, what are surface water futures, particularly in light of climate change? We've got a very strong modeling group at the CSIR that can provide us with those futures and projections, and we've got good hydrologists who can also assist us in terms of uh, interpreting what those climatic conditions mean in terms of uh, available water. And, uh, sorry. Um, and furthermore, some of the questions that need to be um, answered by the Nexus is what industrial options are there to optimize priorities? This is a space where the CSIR alone cannot be able to, to take that further because this requires uh, much more development economic strengths that are needed. Uh, so it's a question of whether the organization partners or develop its um, internal capabilities in terms of linking natural resources with, uh, uh, with development. And also, the, the nexus provides us, it's a question and an answer that can be provided on the appropriate mix of industrial options that we have as well as technological opportunities that we have to uh, address availability. This is just a simple conceptual framework, um, and this has informed some work that uh, as the CSIR, uh, the CSIR has, is doing uh, for Swaziland, for example. And the next question in Swaziland is very simple. It's that um, the European Union is going to pull the plug on preferential access for sugar products by Swaziland to, um, to them. Now, that's going to have significant economic implications for Swaziland. And uh, in so doing, the Nexus work or the understanding of trade-offs that is being done uh, at NRE or by the NRE of the CSIR is to say, uh, 
what are the implications of water? What are the implications on other land use options? How can you in, uh, increase the lifespan of the sugar industry or competitiveness of the sugar industry? And those are the types of uh, questions that one is, is looking at um, in terms of that study. But that is informed by what, uh, by, by this type of conceptual framework where you've got this quantity, can be anything, it can be water, it can be energy, it can be biomass, it can be land. You've got a certain baseline that you have. But in light of climate change, it might be there or it might be there, depending on what you are talking about. But in terms of your national development objectives, that's where you want to be. So the question is always, what technology and other options are available to close the gap either from here to here or from here to there? So these are the types of questions that we're looking at addressing with the Nexus. And if you look at what you have, um, you, the outputs of what you do there basically help you to draw that type of production possibilities. I, think I studied economics um, many years ago, maybe 20 years or something, but they had something called the production possibilities frontier, where you list the availability of all resources that you have towards a productive process, and usually your most limiting resource is the one that will constrain the amount of production that you can make. And, uh, and this can look in, in any way, where um, you can look at three factors in this instance, land, uh, which is generally fairly the same, or stable, and what energy resources, they can always be grown uh, in most instances, but water, it can be, I mean, I don't know how to create new water, but in most cases I would assume that water will always have a slope that looks like that. But in reality, for South Africa, you might find that your water curve goes this fashion. So which means your level of production, this entire portion, is actually out of question. It's not available for you to achieve what you want. So um, looking at, at, at the fact that I've got about three minutes left, I will just jump to, to my last slide, which looks at what is the way forward for South Africa, and uh, that includes um, the CSIR. I think one of the key things is the definition of production possibilities in light of natural resources is something that, or is a practice uh, that needs to form part of our decision-making uh, endeavors. And I don't think, I know that private sector in most instances always suggest that they are far ahead of the public sector. But in this instance, I don't think so. Um, I was listening to a number of presentations, as I said yesterday on mine, uh, and on shale gas. What were the main considerations? Is how many cubic feet of shale gas do we have on the ground? That's, that will be the determinant of whether we invest or we don't. Not a consideration of what are the trade-offs of that with water. It's the same as uh, in the context of mining as well. All the metrics that we'll get, they'll always be about um, how many years of reserves left. But for you to get the reserves up, there's a number of other resources that are necessary to get those up. So we need to be thinking in that fashion, um, both public and private sector. And another issue is how do we use such thinking because I, I don't want to send a message that natural resources are a constraint uh, to industrial development. But it's all, there's also a positive benefit in that they inform what will give you the best return for your rent and also what is the smartest area to invest uh, your R&D capabilities in and develop a, a competitive advantage uh, on the basis of, of those. And also an understanding of impact of policy options on resources and development. I think the case of Swaziland that I mentioned is just a simple example of how an international policy decision can affect your industrial development options. And developing your tools for understanding the trade-offs between resources and development will help you uh, to achieve that. And I would like to believe that um, the CSIR is well positioned as an organization to lead in this type of work because of the multidisciplinary nature of capabilities, because it can get complex. Right? If, if I was to take just the agricultural sector and look at 
and even when I'm saying agricultural sector, that's very broad. <laughs> when you say beef production, and then you do trade-offs that are associated with beef, beef production, there's a number of skills uh, and capabilities that one needs to build it in order to understand the contribution to an economy-wide uh, production possibility. And um, I'm 21 seconds past my time, so I will end it there, and uh, I'll be happy to hear some more ideas on this issue.